All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Kirby Lambert, and I am the Outreach and Interpretation uh, Manager, or the Manager for the Outreach and Interpretation Program at the Montana Historical Society. And we appreciate you joining us on second Saturday. We have some people here in the audience, uh, quality people here, and hopefully some people watching us on our live stream as well. Um, so those of you who come to some of our programs or, or know me know that I believe in short introductions. And um, this one's going to be no exception in terms of length. But I did decide that I um, wanted to put together a little PowerPoint of my own today as, as part of this introduction. And um, so I thought it was appropriate to have some family photos here since we are talking about family photography. And um, this, I just will point, today's speaker, Becky Cole. <laughs> her handbag. Um, I thought this girl with her mouth open talking animatedly, I thought that was Becca, but I was just corrected. So that's her sister, Ruth. Um, but, but you will see that Becca is herself as well, a good talker. Becca, um, Grew up in Great Falls, she was born in Missouri, grew up in Great Falls, went to Great Falls High School, the University of Montana, where she got her degree in history, and then in 1979, came here to the Montana Historical Society, where she began working with Lori Morrow in our photograph archives, and worked there until 2015? 16. 2016, when she retired. Uh, so, um, lots of time in our photograph archives, and I can say without any hesitation that no one knows our photograph collection better than does Becca, and um, no one knows the subjects of today's talks, the trains and the Bundys and the Good et al. family better than Becca does. If you doubt that she poured herself into her job, this is Becca in a Halloween costume dressed as a daguerreotype. And that's an actual daguerreotype on the um, right side, and you can hardly tell the difference. <laughs> uh, like I say, Becca retired in 2016. Today, she uh, remains active at the Historical Society and where she lives um, in Helena with her husband and her dog, Finley. So it is my pleasure to introduce Becca Cole. <laughs> I can say from here, thank you. Do you see it up there, Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that generous trip down memory lane. I'm pleased to see you here today on a beautiful October Saturday at the beginning of a three-day weekend. Um, I hope you find this is worth your while. There are lots and lots of photographs, and some of you will say it's too quick. Um, you didn't get a chance to look at the pictures. Some of you will say, quit talking so much. But, you know, it's me. So. Uh, the good thing about being here on a Saturday is if you have questions or you want to review some of the photos, we've got hours and hours afterwards. Phoebe Goodell Train and Rodina Train Bundy, longtime Helena residents, sisters-in-law, pioneer women in the West, and adjunct photographers. I'd like to give you a look at imagery, a snapshot if you will, which highlights events of their lives primarily in the decades between 1866 and 1890 in Montana. In 1982, in Montana, the magazine of Western history, photograph archivist Dolores Morrow wrote this article, 19th Century Female Photographers on the Frontier. Using research, she and archivist Sue Jackson and Sue's mother, Elizabeth, had unearthed through hours of looking at archival collections, searching in city directories, and browsing microfilm newspapers. Their search was so exhaustive that little more information concerning the women's professional lives has come to light in the ensuing years. 
However, that 1982 article was not particularly laden with photographs documenting Phoebe and Rodina. So employing the material in this article as a base for information about the Mrs. Train and Bundy, I would like to present images that match or complete some of the facts that are available. As most of you know, when researching the lives of 19th century women, it is difficult to find information about married women that is distinct from their roles as wives and mothers. I've decided to embrace them as family women and as community members and to let your reasoned imaginations join mine in expanding our view. Phoebe Philura Goodell was born near Oconomowoc, Wisconsin in 1850, the daughter of Dwight T. and Catherine Goodell. A decade later, the family, now including three-year-old Clarence, crossed the plains, and this is how they ever said it, crossed the plains following the gold rush to Marysville, California. Dwight T. Goodell, a sawyer and lumberman in Wisconsin, was also a husbandman raising excellent crops. But Goodell soon found that California was too hot, not a climate that he enjoyed. And in less than a year, the family removed to Salem, Oregon, where they lived for three years before once again following the call of gold, relocating in Idaho City, Idaho in 1863. Here Goodell continued to support his family by mining and making wooden stakes, shakes. While Phoebe, as a bright and attractive teenager, grew to be a popular member of the Idaho community. Now, I'll be slipping back and forth between, among the players for a while just to set the scene, so stay with me here. Edgar Train and his older sister, Rodina, were born in New York, two of nine children of Horace Horatio Train and his second wife, also named Rodine. Both Edgar and Rodina were living in Wisconsin in 1852 when Edgar and his good friend, Oliver C. Bundy, who was engaged to Train's sister, Rodina, decided to cross the plains also following the California gold rush. The two fellows had little money and no wagons of their own, but joined a wagon train to do maintenance and help the wagon master keep the train on the move. When they heard about a new strike in Wairica, California, the two split from the train, walking across the Black Rock Desert by night and hiding from Indians during the day. Upon safely reaching their destination, the fellows opened a store for the miners. The accounts from reminiscences are not always without hyperbole, so details may have been enhanced. The records do show, however, that after mining for several years, by 1863, Edgar Train owned a combined photograph gallery, billiard parlor, and retail liquor outlet in Scotts Bar, California. Sounds like a good setup, mm -hmm. kind of a little bit of everything. In addition to having an interest in mining, O.C. Bundy was a photographer and a jeweler, and by 1863, he had left California and relocated to Idaho City, Idaho, where he established a photographic studio. Not one to stay in place for long, Bundy practiced his photography and watchmaking skills in various communities in the Boise Basin during the following three years. We've not been privy to correspondence between Bundy and his fiancée, Rodina, but it must have been very worthwhile, as we're now going on 12 years of engagement. In the 1860 census, Rodina is listed as continuing to teach school in Lindina, a prosperous settlement in Wisconsin. And it was evidently quite cultured as they made a point of mentioning having more than 10 pianos in town. Perhaps not wanting to miss out on Bundy's life around the new diggings in Idaho territory, Edgar Train joined W.G. Cromwell in opening a picture gallery in Idaho City in 1864, owning the shop in his own right by the next year. Along with mining and growing his photo business, Train courted and married that youthful beauty with a sweet personality, Phoebe Goodell, in September of 1865. In 1866, Phoebe's parents, Dwight T. and Catherine Goodell, and old friend Oliver C. Bundy, joined Edgar and Phoebe Train in a move to Helena, Montana Territory. Another gold camp, another opportunity, and this one seemed to be a good fit. Though camping for a few weeks in the area that we now know as the Great Northern District of Helena, 
the Goodells and Trains quickly established residence on the property at the junction of Orofino and Grizzly Gulches, just south of town. Dwight Goodell realized that what Helena needed were vegetables. So here they raised a huge vegetable garden and they built the first lath and plaster home. So you see, this is Grizzly Gulch going up. It's very similar to today and then Orofino off to the right. Renan was just saying how a friend had just purchased a home in this area. Amazing gardens. During this early period in Helena, Edgar worked at the City Photograph Gallery. This studio at 35 Main Street is listed as property of J.C. Brewster, but J.T. Douglas is often mentioned as the photographer from whom Train purchased the gallery in 1867. It appears that several photographers worked with Douglas, Brewster, and Train in the studio at number 35, while Marianne Eckert was sole proprietor of the only other photograph gallery in Helena at the time. Perhaps because of the competition in town, Edgar and Phoebe fashioned a traveling picture outfit and proceeded to move about the countryside taking views of lovely landscapes and interesting activities, primarily in the mining camps. Well, Phoebe is said to have worked side by side with Mr. Train and did so from the first. Mrs. Train worked side by side with Mr. Train and did the retouching of the negatives. This according to Marguerite Greenfield, a local historian who interviewed Phoebe in 1929. Here you can see Clarence Goodell, Phoebe's brother, seated with E.H. Train standing and the traveling photograph gallery in the background. So Clarence putting on his shoes, Edgar, his brother-in-law, cooking up a scoff, I guess. Uh, Always interested in mining camps, Train visited the territorial capital in Virginia City and had Governor Potts and George Calloway pose on the balcony of the executive building. These pictures were so well and carefully made that they are as good today, 1929, as the day they were taken. So that was 1929. Here we are 100 years later. Um, the depth and beauty of the originals is pretty astonishing doesn't always translate to the screen, but they are beautiful. Here in Trapper City, you can see <laughs> the wagon had uh, quite, the road is barely discernible among stumps and rocks. Yet they went out to take some views. This miner's cabin in New York Gulch shows a life of rustic simplicity and mining along the bars of the Missouri River were very attractive to the trains as they built up their inventory of stereographic views. And certainly, some entertainment was called for as well. You can see in this venture to Trout Creek, for photographing and fishing, Edgar's brandishing his fishing pole here, and this little black tent, which I'm going to assume is a uh, photographer's tent. They had to prepare the glass slides, the glass plate negatives, uh, and fix them in the dark. So they ha always had a little black tent along because it had to be done right then. And then some little guys up here crouched in the bushes watching the scene. Maybe he's good at, I don't know, who knows. Anyway, clambering up. And of course, the classic trout Creek flume in the background. Beautiful picture. I keep telling you this, you can't tell. Phoebe's dad was still pursuing the raising of vegetables and an account by one local newspaper editor, a single man without wife or family, complains of the amount of vegetables that made their way to his desk. He has no idea how to prepare them for eating and is abashed at the generosity of the trains and Goodells. Here you see Dwight T. Goodell's prize-winning vegetables from the first Montana State Fair. This editor claimed to have turnips 12 inches in diameter, carrots a foot long, and cabbage that weighed eight pounds. Give them a couple weeks, they'd weigh 12 pounds, they said. Hmm. Well, excuse me. 
got too involved in my vegetables. In the early weeks of January 1868, first-born child Ada Catherine made her appearance, and the train soon moved from Phoebe's parents' house to a small home of their own on Bridge Street. After the first of several devastating fires, they moved into the home which they built on Cutler Street. At about the same time, it became clear that the large garden property on Orofino and Grizzly Gulch, owned by the Goodells and trains, did not include the mineral rights, and people wanted to get in there and mine. So the Goodells um, homesteaded, one of the earliest homesteaded, west on Highway 12 West area, um, where they had the property that some of which they later sold to Colonel Broadwater for his hotel and plunge, and then after that, uh, State Nursery owned the property. The home at there at the State Nursery is still there on the south side of the road as you go out. It's kind of surrounded by trees and bushes, but, but it's there just the same. <clears throat> Oliver Bundy had accompanied his friends to Helena, but, restless as ever, spent very little time there before heading to Blackfoot City, where he repaired watches and jewelry and continued to have an interest in mining. By August of 1868, Bundy is established back in Helena in the firm of Schultz and Bundy as a watchmaker and jeweler. In November of that year, there's a notice in the paper that Bundy will leave tomorrow for America. He has announced that he will return in the spring with a large and well-assorted stock of goods and that he also intends to come back spliced. Towards the end of March in 1869, this appeared in the Helena Weekly Herald, and I just have to read the whole article. It's entitled, Constancy, from a private letter received per last mail from O.C. Bundy, Esquire, of the firm of Schultz and Bundy of this city and postmarked in Boston, February 12, 1869, we make the following extract. The copy of the Weekly Herald you have been sending to Miss R.B. Train has been coming all right, but as the lady has been changing her name, you will oblige by changing the address to Mrs. R.B. Bundy. Miss Train has been waiting for my return these many years that she might call her name Bundy and I, after 17 years absence, have returned and made good my early vow by marrying her. We shall start for Montana by the earliest boats. As I said earlier, Rodina had had a long career as a school teacher and was also very committed to a life in the Methodist Church. Scholarship, meditation, and family life with her parents and large number of siblings appear to be what occupied her early years. But at the age of 45, she was ready to head out for the territory to cross the plains with her longtime love. From 17 years of correspondence with Oliver and with her brother Edgar, one imagines that Rodina had a fairly accurate idea of the lifestyle on the mining frontier. Still, we must admire the pluck and loyalty and faith that propelled her up the Missouri River and through the canyons to Helena. Here we see a lovely family portrait, probably captured by O.C. Bundy, of his wife, Rodina, recently arrived in Helena posed with her brother Edgar and his family, Phoebe and Ada, in their photograph gallery. The Bundy's extended visits in Helena were replete with joint photographic projects involving Edgar and Phoebe as well as the Goodell family. They were always potted plants and songbirds in the studio, and you can see that the camera used then were not particularly portable. I mean, wow, big. Even the little one is pretty darn big. I think the ladies are holding a panoramic view. Uh, it, it's hard to think, but, but they did manage to copy, you know, like you do snap, 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 and make panoramas. I have seen early, early panoramas of Helena, which I assume this is going to be one of. And then you, you can see Mr. Train is looking at a stereograph. And little Ada hanging out. These people enjoyed family activities and each other's company. Although Phoebe was 15 years old when she married and Rodina was 45, 
There's camaraderie between the women as they care for older family members and play with the children. Their connected interest in Christianity, temperance, and social interaction, and the friendship and business dealings of the two men made for lifelong partnerships through several generations. 1870 finds Rodina keeping house and Oliver repairing watches and jewelry in Helena. But later that year, they moved to Deer Lodge when Brother Edgar decides that opening a branch photograph gallery there would be a great idea. The New Northwest newspaper explains that Mr. Stipe and Bundy have leased a photograph gallery. Mr. William Stipe is much experienced and O.C. Bundy, a practical watchmaker and jeweler, locates in the same building. He will open out the finest stock of watches and jewelry ever bought to the west side. Of course, with his wandering ways, it's not long before Oliver constructs his own photograph car. In a biographical sketch, Bundy states that he constructed his own photograph car for his own business, the first ever built and used in the territory. For the next five years, Rodina and Oliver travel the byways of Montana in the summers and spend the winters operating their photo business in the Sun Pearl Gallery, formerly owned by A.F. Thrasher in Virginia City. So here's the car, probably parked at Raidersburg. That's often where they left it during the winter. Um, you see Rodina standing in the doorway. And all these ads, you know, it's probably like now, you got sponsors to go out, take pictures. But over here on the side, it still says that he's working with jewelry and watches. <clears throat> it's during this time that we first noticed that Rodina has her own logo on the backs of carte de visite portraits that she has made. Although the sitters are often unidentified, Rodina and Oliver made sure that Rodina would get credit for her work at the gallery. Listed in the 1873 city directory, the Virginia City Photograph Gallery, Jackson Street, Virginia City, Montana Territory, Mr. O.C. Bundy and Lady are now prepared to take pictures of all the latest styles and at the most reasonable rates. Parties will find at our reception room an artistic and varied selection of mountain views. Those desiring pictures are invited to call soon. And I don't know if you know how long these exposures had to be. Um, see that that's the base and that's another base of these headstands, these clamps that would keep you from moving so the camera didn't get a blurred image. But here's Mrs. O.C. Bundy, her own logo. It's kind of exciting for the time. There's little documentary information about Phoebe's participation in gallery life, but this view of the Train family at work in the studio illustrates the care that Phoebe offered in producing impeccable images. You see that these large images have beautiful depth and rich tones. Might not be quite so apparent, like I said, on the, on the big screen, but the original prints are still beautiful. Note the retouching station where Phoebe works, the large cameras, the clamps, the headrests, and the bird cages. Some galleries used little mechanical birds, the old watch the birdie thing. This served to raise the sitter's focus and to lighten their demeanor. The other end of the gallery space where we're from whence we are taking this picture, uh, it was filled with furniture for a parlor-type waiting room, potted plants to take advantage of the glass walls, which admitted plenty of sunlight, a few more spittoons, because, and, and, you know, whoops. It's not like, well, goodness. Like, they're kind of missing the spittoons, I think you can notice this. But they're there. Um, Anyway, and then there are examples on the wall of the kind of work you might expect from Train's Gallery. In 1872, the Helena Weekly Herald notes, we dropped into the city photograph gallery yesterday, and while, we're there, while we were there, we were shown a large size photograph of Mrs. E.H. Train, wife of the artist. It is 14 by 17 inches, finished in watercolors by Mrs. Train herself, and elegantly framed. This is decidedly the finest picture, in our judgment, ever executed in this territory. 
and is another evidence to the perfection which photography has arrived. So that's a pretty picture. When you look at the details, you see that she's you know, drawn in the, and the little eyelashes, the details here on the ear, the jewelry, combines to make it in the distance a very 3D and very, very lifelike. And this is 1872. Um, the writer goes on to commend the trains for views of Helena from new standpoints and even images of the burned areas of town. The burned areas, you say, fires, the bane of Helena's existence. In 1869, 1872, and 1874, well, actually, Last Chance Gulch was like a huge flu as the wind howled and still howls to this day along the canyon of the street. In May of 1869, the citizens of Virginia City learned with deep and heartfelt regret of the great disaster that has befallen the citizens of our sister city of Helena caused by the late destructive fire that has laid that beautiful and enterprising city in ashes. We tender not only our sympathy and condolence, but also such material aid as we can afford to alleviate suffering and repair the losses of those who have been made destitute by this calamity. It's unclear if any aid was given to the trains, but following the 1869 fire, Edgar built his gallery above the Cosmopolitan Hotel at number 43 Main Street. Then again, in 1872, the Helena townsfolk proved their mettle by salvaging what they could of their businesses. And though he lost most of his work and equipment in that fire, Edgar and Phoebe once again rebuilt the studio on Main Street at the Cosmopolitan Hotel. 1872 was also the year that a new Masonic temple was to be built in Helena. The Masonic demonstration in this city on Monday, June 24th, on the occasion of laying the cornerstone of the new Masonic temple, was probably the grandest and most imposing event of the kind that has ever transpired in this territory. Hundreds of men, women, and children had assembled, scaled roofs, and covered the tops of surrounding buildings. Mr. Train, prepared with his camera at the proper moment, took an excellent photographic view of the scene. The temple promises, when finished, to be the finest edifice in Montana. The town folk were astonished by the clarity of this view, as one could discern individual persons in the crowd. And as I looked through it, noticing that there's only a couple of women in the crowd, mostly the women and kids are up here in this area, but right here, I think it's ex Beadler in his distinctive look with his hands on his lapels, being very proud. Right there. <laughs> the trains were active in Helena's social life and were members of the Helena Dancing Club. In 1872, they attended a grand masquerade ball held at the Masonic Hall. Edgar appeared wearing a simple mask while Phoebe was costumed as a flower girl. We were wondering if her costume was inspired by London's Covent Garden, I'm thinking Liza Doolittle, um, the little flower primrose sellers, or perhaps by the recent opening of the flower garden, Helen's, Helena's first nursery, located just north of the Northern Pacific Depot in Helena. Here we see proprietor Adolf Schwenzer watering plants at the nursery. This favorite place of resort the flower garden, will be visited daily by ladies and gentlemen who will eagerly rush to this beautiful rural spot and thus for a time gain a temporary respite from the cares and perplexities of city life, which as we mentioned included quite a lot of fires. So this is a nice garden place, kind of over by Lincoln School. That's the flower garden area. As you remember, Phoebe's family were famous for their gardening as well. And here over at the left by the greenhouse, you can see her dad, Dwight Goodell, having a beverage with another gentleman as they inspect the progress of their fellow horticulturist. I'm not certain about the connection of the flower garden nursery and the flower girl costume, but at the next year's masquerade, while Mr. Tain Train came in the guise of an honest miner, which the Herald deemed character and costume appropriate, Phoebe came representing the Lady of the Lake. Sir Walter Scott enjoyed great popularity throughout the 19th century, and apparently that affinity for his Ellen Douglas character was at work in Helena 
out on the Montana frontier. For this gala, Train did not miss the opportunity to photograph his wife in costume. As you can see, Bonnie Miss Phoebe swathed in tartan, mask on the chair at hand. I think, and what's going on up here? This is what, how she's got her hair kind of styled around this plaid cap. And, and then this necktie. Hmm. But with all things Scottish, The Masquerade Ball was a fabulous end to the club's dances of the season, featuring a sumptuous midnight repast and dancing until 4 o'clock in the morning. But enough socializing. With the designation of Yellowstone as a national park in 1872, there was increased interest in the phenomena observable there. Not once to pass on adventuring and possible income opportunities, both Mr. Bundy and Train took tours of Geyserland with an eye towards making saleable views. Here we see the leaf formation at Periodical Le Lake. Paul Rubenstein of the Yellowstone Stereo View Collectors Group advertises having at least 74 views of Yellowstone Park scenes with imprints from Bundy and Train, both working together and individually. While Phoebe remained busy retouching and finishing the card and stereograph images produced by the gallery, little Ada was flourishing and certainly occupying much of Phoebe's time, perhaps precluding adventures in the traveling photograph gallery. I thought you should note the sewing project on Phoebe's lap, a nod to her abilities as a seamstress, as well as the thread and thimble displayed on the lower edge of her dress. <laughs> These details, I think, are charming. Charming. By 1873, Helena had grown to look like this. You can see how the town has developed around the fire tower, fire tower hill. We can trace a square starting at the lower left where Maine goes up, turns east to Broadway, which is hidden behind the hill, except you can see the tower of St. Paul's Methodist Church there. Goes up to Rodney, turns south again, and then turns west on Bridge Street, which is State Street, coming down the hill. And Cutler Street, this blue, is their home, the home of the trains. So we're looking from Hale Reservoir. And then, whoops. So we were up there, now we're down here. <laughs> well, gee whiz. <laughs> Excuse me. If you notice her little china doll sitting in the window. With the train home, uh, proud of their neatly home of their <laughs> proud of their neatly kept home, Edgar and Phoebe pose with Ada and her favorite doll in front of their residence at 31 East Cutler Street. The home, well maintained, features window cornices from Minnesota and hops growing to provide shade from the western sun. It's a pretty tidy house compared to some of the rest of those places, I'll say. Between excursions around southwestern Montana, trains photographed homes and businesses in Helena. Their many friends welcomed them, giving these photo shoots a semblance of social calls rather than work. Here we see Edgar Train and Ada walking along Benton Avenue in front of the John T. Murphy home. Often the Helena images involved women and children, contrasting with the rougher male-dominated images taken in mining camps. This softer look at the world and the fact that Edgar is in several of these images makes me wonder if Phoebe wasn't orchestrating some of this work. Continuing a walk through town, we see Mrs. Lehman and Grandma Beche over at Lehman's house on Edward Street. And Edgar, there's uh, Edgar posed with Mr. and Mrs. Molitor and their dog. Uh, Molitor was an assayer and a good friend of Train. I like how the neighbor lady's coming to photobomb. This black man over here is standing by the garden. Everybody ready for a picture. Should I go like this? Okay, <laughs> fine for you. Uh, In stark contrast, and this is fine, this is fine, I can... Oh. In stark contrast, 
Train's classic image of teepee homes on Mount Helena looks more like an inspection tour than a cordial visit. None of the residents are visible, household goods are tightly packed up, and a few guys in suits pose awkwardly in the common areas. Oliver C. and Rodina Bundy continued their photographing tours in Montana areas south and east of Helena, as well as the aforementioned Yellowstone Park tours. Over the next few years, they rolled out the car for summer work. Pictured here, Rodina once more in the doorway of their photograph car parked in Glendale. The car is right here. She's in the doorway. I was saying earlier, you know, there must have been some signal that OC could climb to the top of this hill and get all these people all over town to come and pose at the right time. <laughs> The Bundys resumed their visits to mining camps and smaller settlements, even venturing into Idaho. The Salmon River Bridge in Idaho and Brown's Bridge in the Big Hole are two kind of amazing and uh, useful constructs. I was wondering if there was a subliminal message that Mr. Bundy and Mrs. Bundy were trying to get across that you could travel, that there were modern conveniences, such as bridges. Um, good PR for getting out into the country. They spent their winters in Virginia City. Here's a picture of their grocery store and news agent. And as always, we're very interested in the activities of the church. The Madisonian mentions that the Bundys have returned for the winter and not only have a burnisher, but a baby charmer as well. I don't know, charming babies is tough business, I think. We've mentioned the importance of temperance and Christianity in the Bundys' lives, but an active interest in politics adds a third element to their union. Pictured here is the Council of the Territorial Legislature posed in Bundy's studio in 1874. 19 or so fellows crammed in for a group portrait. There's a sense of gravitas leavened with the logistics, the realities of being able to take a decent portrait with limited space. You see by the corner of the bed at the left that these sitters are invited into the very home of the Bundys, as must have been the case when portraits were made in their photograph car. There's no way to avoid the fact that Oliver and Rodina were definitely in this together, be it business, social life, or spirituality. Following the giant conflagration on Last Chance Gulch in 1874, and once more losing all of their gallery's contents, the trains decided to move their gallery away from Main Street and built an addition to their home at 31 Cutler Street. Here you see the classic glass wall and ceiling of the studio area built onto their tidy home. So, Phoebe, Ada, and then you see in here Mr. Train posing in his studio. I was asked what these upper windows were for. I don't know if it was for airing, a possible balcony in the future. You often see those full-length windows. That fall, the Helena Herald tells us, Train's work has never been equaled in the territory. This is in part accounted for by the elegant gallery Mr. Train has fitted up and the use of the best material and chemicals that money can buy. They do not mention that when you're replacing your equipment every couple of years, it's likely to be state of the art. There's much visiting between Bundys and Trains in these years. Entries in the state fairs reflect both names individually and together and while the Bundys were expanding their circle of friends throughout the state, Edgar and Phoebe endeared themselves throughout the Helena community. The new Catholic Cathedral of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary was a short walk from their home, and it's interesting to speculate about whether this interior photograph was taken in real time or posed following the service. It seems unlikely that the trains were capable of reportage-style capturing of images, giving the time it took for a good exposure although we had seen one advertisement that said they could take a baby's photograph in one minute. Certainly even that is a long time for a baby to pose, but maybe it worked in this church situation. Having said that, I 
couldn't help but notice that this lady turned around and looked because there's her face and there's her back. So does that make sense to you? You can see the back of her head as well as the front of her face. Of particular interest to Edgar, the U.S. Mint's new assay office on Broadway, which is still there today as an apartment house. You can see the county courthouse in the background. And this appears to recently, just very recently, have been finished in the photo. The firehouse where firemen show off their kids as well as their firefighting equipment. And Phoebe and her girlfriends having a sewing party in the other side of the studio. So this is the reception area where you can see examples of the work they did and the plants. Stereo, um, stereo, stereopticons here for viewing and that she's got a photo album for viewing. Sewing machine, it's great. It's this lovely portrait of Miss Ada, which is a tintype of her, about seven years old, and which I really admire the care that was taken by a loving parent to highlight her jewelry. And it's a little hard to tell here, but her little pink cheeks have been filled in and a, she's wearing a blue ribbon in her hair. As Bundy and Train, the fellows once again joined forces and toured the Prickly Pear Canyon in the summer of 1875. The Daily Herald reads, this was successful beyond most sanguine expectations and a series of views in the canyon and vicinity have been laid on our table. Fine views of the head and the mouth of the canyon are given and also some from several of the numerous bridges spanning the Prickly Pear. You've most likely seen these images as the views are certainly archetypes for the road between Helena and Fort Benton. There's evidently a good relationship between the gallery and the daily and weekly Herald newspapers, as so much of this positive verbiage comes from that source. Robert Fisk was the Herald's owner and is pictured at his Rodney Street home with his wife Elizabeth and daughter Grace and house guests Isa and Nellie Morrow, family of the South Dakota photographer S.J. Morrow, during a visit to Helena. This house is still extant. Uh, it's been added on. What is on the left is duplicated on the right now. But this is the corner of 7th, let's see, the southeast corner of 7th and Rodney. The Herald goes on to say, not only as a photographer does Mr. Train take high rank, but also as a writer on photography, his manuscript being eagerly sought after by leading magazines devoted to the advancement of the profession. Train writes for the Philadelphia Photographer's Newsletter, Mosaics. To make good pictures, you must be in good humor yourself and keep your sitters in good humor. Do not stand too much upon your dignity. Unbend, be affable, don't lock horns with your sitter. It does not conduce to pleasant expressions. Consult their tastes, humor their whims as far as possible. And if they perpetuate the original witticism about breaking the machine, laugh at it as if you had never heard it before. And proceed to make them the picture that will best satisfy them and yourself. Do not be afraid of retouching too much. Your only danger is in retouching too badly. People nowadays are not like Oliver Cromwell. They do not want to be painted warts, pimples, and all. In fact, I sometimes think that story was a slander on the great commoner. About this time, the association of Edgar Train and Oliver Bundy with George P. Reeves comes into play. Mr. Reeves was a jeweler in Helena who invented and patented a shoelacer or fastener, like the speed hooks at the top of your boots, a neatly and ingeniously constructed hook to take the place of the common eyelet. Train bought half of the rights to this patent and Bundy purchased a quarter of the interest in it. Because Train had the major shares in the patent, it was resolved that he would proceed east to, to develop machinery for the manufacturing and to put the laser on the market. Amid preparations for departing to a new life on the East Coast, Phoebe gave birth to son Percy in April of 1876. 
Have your centennial portraits made. See yourself in the next century, advertised the gallery cheerfully. Not only were Bundy and Train the sole US territorial photographers tapped for inclusion in the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition, each won several first prizes. Throughout the year, arrangements were made and agreements were formed, and the Bundys bought out the Train Picture Gallery in Helena. Advertisements and stories abound in newspapers from Diamond City to Fort Benton, Bozeman to Deer Lodge for months discussing the prowess of the Bundys as photographers and their abilities to continue the excellent quality of work at the Helena studio of Train. Upon their move to Helena, the Bundys quickly settled into the photographic business and the broader social life associated with the larger town. Both Rodina and Oliver had long associations with the Independent Order of Good Templars, a group that fought demon alcohol as the crusaders of old fought for Christianity. The Good Templars did not discriminate in their membership by gender or by race and were most interested in uplifting all members of society. The Methodist Church also played a large part in their lives and Bundys were lifelong friends with Harbor-educated minister Francis A. Regan and his wife Ida, pictured here on their wedding day in Helena. This imposing picture of St. Paul's Methodist Church highlights its importance as one of the earliest buildings on Catholic Hill. At this time, this is before the cathedral, this was the Catholic Church up there. And the Methodists are really taking front and center at this time. Bundys attended statewide church conventions, joined the international Sunday school movement, and strongly supported efforts to have a Methodist college in Montana. Though there was, to my way of thinking, an incredible amount of travel between the states and Helena, there must have been a longing for family that inspired this compilation of early day photoshopped splendor. Perhaps assembled to keep the family near in their hearts, this image takes bits and pieces of favorite family images and composes the lovely scene of domestic tranquility. A little bit of the perspective is out of kilter. This uh, cupboard is pretty big uh, compared to the people. But amazing detail has been observed to make this appear to be an actual panoramic one sitting photograph. As they pursued various avenues, the Bundys, the Trains, and the Goodells must have loved having this photograph in their home. So here you can see some details, um, or not. Edgar is, is tossing the ball, the dog's very interested, tossing the ball to Percy. Cat doesn't care. Uh, you can see, as always, Rodina has a book and a stack of books next to her. Phoebe's doing her crocheting and Ada's playing the organ. I don't know if you can make this out, but it says Percy Train. Five. <laughs> the train studio, oops. The train studio, as it was managed by the Bundys, was a salon of sorts to visitors from throughout the state. The Butte Weekly Miner tells us, here you will be pleasantly entertained with intelligent conversation on art topics, paintings, exquisite, exquisite engravings, and triumphs of the photographic art will be displayed for your admiration. And if you wish to have your photograph taken, it will be executed in the highest style of art. Rodina, as a member of the WCTU, was active in founding a library and a coffee shop reading room in Helena to encourage persons not interested in saloon life. The Bundys had a lively interest in politics with Oliver working on the first ward, city and territorial levels in various capacities. When the Constitutional Convention met in Helena in 1884, the independent record extols. The photographing apparatus of O.C. Bundy went through an ordeal yesterday that made it quiver. It was elevated behind the president's chair at the Constitutional Convention where it was kept for six whole minutes while a photograph of the convention was taken. Every member of the convention put on his brightest smile for the occasion 
When the people of Montana, 100 years from now, celebrate Constitution Day, they will gaze upon reprints of that photograph and say, what sweet dispositioned creatures the fathers were, to be sure. Here's a little closer view. While there is one of these prints in the photograph archives, I must admit that I never once gazed upon the fathers, thinking, what sweet dispositioned creatures. Also, the six minutes turned into 18 or more over two separate days as the negatives kept getting messed up. Now, the CONCON was a big deal, a one-of-a-kind event, and I can just see Rodina as O.C. is returning home to process the image, his dismay that it did not turn out, he hesitantly asking for another sitting, which also didn't work out, although according to one newspaper, this might have been because the members and the staff did not show up for the picture. But finally, the triumph is the third try. The image we see today is printed and distributed to the public. The fathers. <laughs> Bundy was also seated as a regular member of juries and grand juries, encouraging justice in the community. I did not discover exact accounts of Oliver Bundy's net worth over a lifetime of work and investment, but one obituary listed his retirement with a good income as a positive aspect of his life. Actively opposed to out-of-staters coming in to undercut the business of local photographers, and perhaps wearying of his role as a grand old man of photography, in Montana, Oliver retired from his profession in 1888. Church work and traveling to visit relatives and friends occupied his final years, and following a brief illness, he died of peritonitis aged 64 in 1891. The residents of Virginia City remembered Oliver fondly and heartily sympathized with Mrs. Bundy in her sad bereavement. Members of several good Templar, Templar lodges attended him to his grave. The train's life on the East Coast was devoted to manufacturing and sales of the shoelacer, and many visits cross-country to visit their Helena and Judith Basin families. Percy and Ada attended schools while in the East, with Ada graduating from the Boston Conservatory of Music. By the late 1880s, trains returned to Helena, and Edgar, following his interest in chemistry and mining, opened the Utah, Utah Assay Office at the foot of Broadway which he ran until his death at age 68 in 1899. His integrity was unquestionable, and though he missed many opportunities to his own advantage, he was held in the highest respect by all who knew him. Rodina Bundy continued on at 31 East Cutler Street for several years, then moved to a variety of residences in Helena over the next decade. Continuing her association with the WCTU, Good Templars and the Methodist Church, Rodina also traveled to visit friends and relatives, and with Francis Riggin, fought a major legal battle over the disposition of an 80-acre property in Madison County. They won. Spending her last days at the home of her niece, Ada Train Fisk, Rodina, at the age of 80, joined her brother and husband to rest at Forestville Cemetery. The deceased was beloved by all who knew her, for she always gave a smile and pleasant word to those around her. A good woman has gone. Ada Train lived in Helena, married Emmett Fisk, and had several children. Percy Train worked in assaying, married Lena Dillard, and also had several children. Both Ada and Percy were parents of twins. I must take exception to the fact that Percy's twins were named Lucy and Lucille. Lucille and Lucy. And it's Anyway, with second wife Agnes, uh, Percy ends up in Nevada, locating fossils for the Smithsonian Institution and writing a book about Native American healing plants. Phoebe Train persevered, outliving both husband Edgar and daughter Ada. Referred to as Grandma Train and beloved in the community, Phoebe remained active in Eastern Star, the Montana Pioneers Group, and had some of the loveliest flower gardens in town. She traveled often visiting friends in Dillon, Butte, and Bozeman, and going regularly to visit her brother, Clarence, and family in Philbrook, near Lewistown, and to check on properties she owned there. 37 years after she buried her life partner, Phoebe Goodell Train died in Helena on March 21, 1936. 
While her long and useful earthly journey is terminated, the career of this grand woman will be cherished by her friends and associates. Thank you for joining me in a little cherishing. <laughs> Have you questions? Oh yes, Miss Dean. The question is, how did the photo archives come to have these photos? There are lots and lots of Bundy and Train images in the photo archives collection. A large number of them came from Agnes, this woman, uh, Agnes Scott Train. Uh, she was a museum curator uh, all her life, and she loved coming here with Percy to visit Grandma Train, and the attic was full, evidently, of pictures. So she got all the stories and all this stuff and wrote on the back of these stereographs, particularly, and so they all have her name as well, but in, I think in about 1953, she managed to get those to the Historical Society. Mrs. Bundy, um, I mean, Mrs. Train also gave several images, but the problem is in the, in the um, Marguerite Greenfield uh, interview from 1929, they say that the negatives were in the upstairs, the ones after 1874, were in the upstairs of that house at 31 Cutler Street, and that in 1928 there was a fire there that ruined those. So the original negatives, we, ha we got a few in with the Jord collection, but mostly we just have vintage prints. I personally just want to point this out. Whoops. I guess I don't want to point that out. Never mind. <laughs> Why doesn't it come back? I guess we're done. <laughs> no. No, I didn't. It's not on it. It doesn't matter. Hmm? Let's see if anybody it's has any questions. I'll... Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs>